be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword presented by the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call in during this program to ask your Bible questions. Call 828-465-3009. This episode of The Word and Sword includes our continuing study of authority as we look at how to establish Bible authority. We also pick up in our ongoing study of denominationalism as we examine the false doctrine of premillennialism and how it contradicts the Word of God. Finally, we notice an amazing account of demon possession where one man is miserable as he is possessed by thousands of demons and how this is similar to our lives when we allow Satan to control us. Again, we thank you for watching the Word and Sword program. We encourage you to call 828-465-3009 and ask your Bible questions. We also invite you to visit our website at wordandsword.com. That's wordandsword.com. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight, thou my soul shelter, and thou my high There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible. So you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning his will and submitting to his commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth, Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. With this lesson, we continue in our series of studies on the subject of authority and the idea of how to establish Bible authority. We begin in Acts chapter 22 where Paul is in Jerusalem, and because of his presence there, there has been a riot stirred up. The Jews are striving to kill Paul, and the Romans rush in to take control of the situation and find out what is going on. And in Acts twenty-two twenty-three 23 is where we want to begin reading and see what unfolds here and then note how it relates to authority and the need for authority. 
In Acts 22, verse 23, Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I have obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. And what this is illustrating for us for is that the Romans needed authority in order to bind the apostle Paul because he was a Roman citizenship. And they did not have that authority. What the actions they had taken here were without authority. And so we'd recognize that authority is something is needed. Authority is something that's needed within a society in order to uphold laws and to keep order and peace within that society, within that nation. And authority is needed in the matter of religion because we recognize when people buy into this concept that anything is acceptable, that chaos is what follows. Today, we see that in our society where we're being told, you can live your truth and I can live my truth and every person has a different truth by which they live. So they say that each person does what is right in his own eyes. Well, we see what happens when that philosophy is accepted by the people around us. There begins to be chaos and havoc, and the very foundations of our society or the very fabric of our society is being pulled apart. We have many problems and many troubles that did not exist at one time in our nation. We want to understand that in authority or in religion, we need authority from the right source, from the right place. And that right place is the Word of God. As 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. So if you believe in God, and you believe in Jesus as the Christ, then you need to come to the Bible for authority. We need to accept that as the standard, the only standard by which we are to live as those who would seek to please God. So authority, we understand, helps us in establishing a relationship with God that we may have fellowship with him, that we may realize salvation, that we may have eventually a home in heaven. Authority explains why we practice what we practice, because it defines that for us. We don't make up our own minds. We don't each do what we all feel like is acceptable to God, but we go to the standard that is the word of God, and therefore, it would guide and direct and explain what it is that we are to do and what we are not to do as well. It tells us about the things we practice, about how we worship God. It tells us the names that we use to designate ourselves. How do we describe ourselves? The Bible reveals this to us, and that's the authority by which we are to go and on which we are to stand. So authority is needed. And we want to examine in this lesson that uh, the Bible shows us how authority is established. It's inherent within the Word of God, and we're going to take a look at that. We're going to begin by noticing different ways that authority is established 
And then notice where the apostles and saints of the first century use those ways to establish authority in a particular issue that they were facing in their day. So let's open up the Word of God and study together. We'll come back in just a minute, and we're going to notice that first way of establishing authority. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. As we study how to establish authority, we want to notice that the simplest and most basic way to establish authority is by a direct statement. If we find a direct statement in the Word of God, uh, something that just makes a declaration, then we are going to see a way that we can establish authority. First of all, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. When we read that, we read what we might call a statement of fact, a direct statement that is given in the inspired Word of God. And from what we read here, we can teach some things with authority. This is not a guess. This is not an opinion. This is not my truth versus your truth. This is just reality. This is truth. And one of the things we can teach is the existence of God, that God is because it says in the beginning, God. Well, this is our authority. The Bible is. So when we see in the beginning God, that means we can teach with proper authority from heaven that God exists. We can also teach that God created the universe. And as we study on down through Genesis chapter 1 and go into Genesis chapter 2, if we go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, we understand that God created the universe in six days and he rested on the seventh day. We can teach that with Bible authority. There's no authority to teach otherwise. In other words, there's no authority to teach that God doesn't exist. There's no authority to teach that God did not create the universe, and there is no authority to teach something other than the six days of creation. There's no authority for teaching the Big Bang Theory. There's no authority for teaching that it took millions or billions of years for the universe to develop. There are people who try to mix these two things when it comes to what the Bible says and what men who proclaim to know science say, the theories of Big Bang, the theories of evolution, things like that. Well, in the Bible, when you read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and you continue to read that God created those things in six days, we recognize there's no authority to teach the Big Bang theory, to teach the evolution theory, that is Darwinian in nature. So there's no authority for those things, and those are outside the Word of God and condemned, therefore, in the Word of God. Now let's notice some direct statements as the authority in direct statements relates to the plan of salvation. So first of all, in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, we can establish authority that one must believe in order to be saved from a direct statement. Because Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Belief is essential to salvation. We have authority to say you have to believe in Jesus in order to be saved. There's no authority to say people who don't believe in Jesus will be saved and go to heaven because the Bible does not support that. So we have authority to insist on someone believing in Jesus as the Christ in order to have their sins forgiven 
and have the hope of everlasting life. As Jesus said in John 8, verse 24, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So there is a direct statement that establishes the authority that you must believe in order to be saved. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and we see here that there's a direct statement that men must repent in order to have their sins forgiven. In Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have to repent to receive the remission of sins. A similar statement is made in Acts 3 verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. How do you have your sins remitted? How do you have your sins blotted out? Well, we've already read that we have to believe in order to do that. And we now read in Acts 2.38 and Acts chapter 3, verse 19, that Peter also says you must repent in order to be saved. Repent to have your sins remitted or blotted out. So we have the authority to tell people, to tell men, you must repent. You must repudiate that sin in which you've been living. You must get that out of your life. You must regret that you have committed sin against God and want to leave that out of your life and make a change in your life to serve the Lord. We have the authority to teach that and to say that is a condition of salvation. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, let's notice that the Word of God also tells us that we have to confess Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Luke 12 verse 8, Jesus makes this statement, Also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God, and he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So we have to confess him before men and not be ashamed of that, not be embarrassed about that, but to declare freely and openly, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we can tell people, with authority from the Word of God, that you must confess Him in order to go to heaven. But then also, we can tell people you must be baptized in order to be saved. We've already noted two of these examples that we have in Mark 16 and also in Acts chapter 2, where we read about direct statements from the Lord and from the Apostle Peter. In Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So the Lord says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's a direct statement from the mouth of the Lord. So you want to know about the condition of salvation. And we're not talking about the condition of condemnation here, but how is it that you are saved? Well, you're saved when you believe and you're baptized, as is stated by the Lord here. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, again, notice this. The apostle Peter, being guided by the Holy Spirit to preach to the people on the day of Pentecost, he said here in Acts 2, 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So repent and be baptized. Jesus says, believe and be baptized to be saved. Peter here says, repent and be baptized. Are they giving us two different plans of salvation? No. They are giving us conditions of salvation that the hearers needed to know. And so Jesus gives a summary of the gospel in Mark 16, 16, believe and be baptized, you'll be saved. Peter here is speaking to men who have been convicted of killing the Christ and told that Jesus is Lord and Savior. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. When those men asked what they needed to do, Peter said, repent and be baptized. So we understand there are direct statements in the word of God that tell us we must be baptized in order to be saved. So we have the authority to teach that. We do not have the authority to tell men you don't have to believe to be saved. 
We don't have the authority to say you do not need to repent or there is no need of confession or there is no need of uh, baptism for salvation. There's no Bible authority for that. In fact, all those things that we just said are contrary to the Word of God because there are direct statements on which we stand in the authority of God that we find in the Word of God to tell people they must believe, they must repent, they must confess, and they must be baptized in order to be forgiven of their sins, in order to receive salvation, in order to have the hope of everlasting life. Those are direct statements we see in God's Word, and we establish authority one way, very simple way, basic way, is through a direct statement, or sometimes it's called through a direct command in the Word of God. In just a moment, we'll come back and we'll notice another way that authority is established in the Word of God. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, They say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the Word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4, Includes Study Aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. As we study how to establish authority, we want to notice that the simplest and most basic way to establish authority is by a direct statement. If we find a direct statement in the Word of God, uh, something that just makes a declaration then we are going to see a way that we can establish authority. First of all, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. When we read that, we read what we might call a statement of fact, a direct statement that is given in the inspired Word of God. And from what we read here, we can teach some things with authority. This is not a guess. This is not an opinion. This is not my truth versus your truth. This is just reality. This is truth. And one of the things we can teach is the existence of God, that God is because it says in the beginning, God. Well, this is our authority. The Bible is. 
So when we see in the beginning God, that means we can teach with proper authority from heaven that God exists. We can also teach that God created the universe. And as we study on down through Genesis chapter 1 and go into Genesis chapter 2, if we go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, we understand that God created the universe in six days and he rested on the seventh day. We can teach that with Bible authority. There's no authority to teach otherwise. In other words, there's no authority to teach that God doesn't exist. There's no authority to teach that God did not create the universe, and there is no authority to teach something other than the six days of creation. There's no authority for teaching the Big Bang Theory. There's no authority for teaching that it took millions or billions of years for the universe to develop. There are people who try to mix these two things when it comes to what the Bible says and what men who proclaim to know science say, the theories of Big Bang, the theories of evolution, things like that. Well, in the Bible, when you read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you continue to read that God created those things in six days, we recognize there's no authority to teach the Big Bang Theory, to teach the evolution theory that is Darwinian in nature. So there's no authority for those things, and those are outside the Word of God and condemned, therefore, in the Word of God. Now let's notice some direct statements as the authority in direct statements relates to the plan of salvation. So first of all, in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, we can establish authority that one must believe in order to be saved from a direct statement. Because Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Belief is essential to salvation. We have authority to say you have to believe in Jesus in order to be saved. There's no authority to say people who don't believe in Jesus will be saved and go to heaven because the Bible does not support that. So we have authority to insist on someone believing in Jesus as the Christ in order to have their sins forgiven and have the hope of everlasting life. As Jesus said in John 8, verse 24, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So there is a direct statement that establishes the authority that you must believe in order to be saved. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and we see here that there's a direct statement that men must repent in order to have their sins forgiven. In Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, the, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have to repent to receive the remission of sins. A similar statement is made in Acts 3 verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. How do you have your sins remitted? How do you have your sins blotted out? Well, we've already read that we have to believe in order to do that. And we now read in Acts 2.38 and Acts chapter 3, verse 19, that Peter also says you must repent in order to be saved. Repent to have your sins remitted or blotted out. So we have the authority to tell people, to tell men, you must repent. You must repudiate that sin in which you've been living. You must get that out of your life. You must regret that you have committed sin against God and want to leave that out of your life and make a change in your life to serve the Lord. We have the authority to teach that and to say that is a condition of salvation. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, let's notice that the Word of God also tells us that we have to confess Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Luke 12, verse 8, Jesus makes this statement. 
Also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before, before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. And he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So we have to confess him before men and not be ashamed of that, not be embarrassed about that, but to declare freely and openly, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we can tell people with authority from the Word of God that you must confess him in order to go to heaven. But then also, we can tell people you must be baptized in order to be saved. We've already noted two of these examples that we have in Mark 16 and also in Acts chapter 2, where we read about direct statements from the Lord and from the apostle Peter. In Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So the Lord says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's a direct statement from the mouth of the Lord. So you want to know about the condition of salvation. And we're not talking about the condition of condemnation here, but how is it that you are saved? Well, you're saved when you believe and you're baptized as is stated by the Lord here. In Acts chapter 2, Verse 38, again, notice this, the apostle Peter, being guided by the Holy Spirit to preach to the people on the day of Pentecost, he said here in Acts 2.38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So repent and be baptized. Jesus says, believe and be baptized to be saved. Peter here says, repent and be baptized. Are they giving us two different plans of salvation? No. They are giving us conditions of salvation that the hearers needed to know. And so Jesus gives a summary of the gospel in Mark 16, 16, believe and be baptized, you'll be saved. Peter here is speaking to men who have been convicted of killing the Christ and told that Jesus is Lord and Savior. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. When those men asked what they needed to do, Peter said, repent and be baptized. So we understand there are direct statements in the word of God that tell us we must be baptized in order to be saved. So we have the authority to teach that. We do not have the authority to tell men you don't have to believe to be saved. We don't have the authority to say you do not need to repent or there is no need of confession or there is no need of uh, baptism for salvation. There's no Bible authority for that. In fact, all those things that we just said are contrary to the word of God because there are direct statements on which we stand in the authority of God that we find in the word of God to tell people they must believe, they must repent, they must confess, and they must be baptized in order to be forgiven of their sins, in order to receive salvation, in order to have the hope of everlasting life. Those are direct statements we see in God's Word, and we establish authority one way, very simple way, basic way, is through a direct statement, or sometimes it's called through a direct command in the Word of God. Now, in just a moment, we'll come back and we'll notice another way that authority is established in the Word of God. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Another way authority is established in the Bible is through approved examples. Examples of people who were guided by the Holy Spirit or there is an indication that the Holy Spirit approved of the actions that they took. So let's first of all notice that there are direct statements saying that we are to follow the examples of the faithful in Philippians chapter 4. 
In verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul writes this, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things or on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So he says, as I have followed the Lord, you follow him. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul states exactly that. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So the Bible tells us here are examples of faithful people and you follow in their footsteps so we can look at them and say this is what Christians are to do. When we look at the life of the Apostle Paul and the actions that he took and we see they're approved, we follow that example. Now there are some examples in the New Testament of where Christians, even apostles such as Peter, fell short of honoring God. That's not an approved example. We understand that. We see that that action is clearly condemned in the Word of God. We might read about an example of where a Christian does something that we understand from another part of God's Word is wrong, that it is sinful, that it is unrighteous. But the Bible makes those things clear, like Ananias and Sapphira lying to the apostles we understand that those things are wrong and sinful. We don't follow those. We have no authority to do what they did. We don't have authority to lie. We understand that. But we're talking about approved examples, things that are commended by God, that we are to follow those things, and we have authority in these things. So one of the things we understand is that we have the authority to condemn and expose false teachers and the things that they would promote. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, you remember where Paul tells Timothy these things. 2 Timothy 2 and beginning in verse 16, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. You know, there are people who get uh, upset when you name an individual who is promoting false teaching, a false doctrine. But here we see an example of where the Apostle Paul, in writing this letter, names individuals he names their doctrine. He names the consequences of those who accept that doctrine. So he's exposing false teachers and the error that they are promoting. And these letters, because we have them today, were circulated publicly. So we have the right, we have the authority to name false teachers and to name the doctrines and to talk about the consequences of those doctrines that we may warn others, do not follow in their error, do not follow in their sin. But then also we have an example of the direct support of preachers by churches in Philippians chapter 4. Verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes this, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. When we look into the New Testament, we see that when a church supported a preacher that was not the local preacher, that they would send the money directly to that preacher. So we have the authority to do that. We have the authority to practice that, and there's not authority to do it in some other way. That is, that a church would support a preacher through a different agency or through some type of corporation. We understand that that's not in the Word of God, but the authority is there for a congregation to send money directly to a preacher 
in order for him to be able to live and provide for his needs, that he may give time and attention to study and to teaching the Word of God. So there are examples in the Word of God that we can learn from and know and understand here's what's right and here's what's wrong. Here's what we are to practice. Here's what we are to do. And here are things that we are not authorized to do or not authorized to practice. So authority is established in the New Testament by approved examples. We're going to come back in a minute and notice another way to establish authority that we use all the time but we maybe don't recognize that we use it. Maybe we've not thought about or examined it, but we're going to see another way of establishing authority that's related to the two we've already studied, and we hope that it will help to enlighten you on what the Bible teaches about how we learn what we are to do to be pleasing and acceptable in God's sight. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828 465 Three zero zero nine. Now, the third way of establishing authority that we read about in God's Word, let's understand that, that we're not just simply pulling this out of thin air, but we see it being used by the Lord, by His apostles in the first century. We read about that in the Word of God, that Word that's been divinely revealed and providentially preserved for us today, we read these ways of establishing authority. And that third way of establishing authority is necessary inference. So there's something that we look at in the Word of God, and we see there is a necessary implication from what is revealed there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to see an example of where Jesus uses necessary implication to establish a doctrinal truth. In Matthew chapter 22, let's notice here verse 23, and we're going to read a little bit in here, but just to get the context, but let's notice what's unfolding here as Jesus is debating with Jewish leaders. In Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 23, says the same day the Sadducees who sat there who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked him saying teacher Moses said that if a man dies having no children his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother now there were with us seven brothers the first died after he had married and having no offspring left his wife to his brother likewise the second also and the third even to the seventh Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. So let's pause for just a moment and notice what the Sadducees are doing here. The Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection, and they're putting a case before Jesus, a hypothetical case. And what they're trying to do in this case is to disprove the possibility of the resurrection by giving an impossible scenario. That's what they think they are doing because they're saying, well, you know, there was a man who had a wife and he died and his brother married him because the law of Moses said that the brother was to marry his deceased brother's wife and bring up offspring for his brother's name and things like that. And so they come up with this scenario saying, well, this happened in a family where there were seven brothers and the woman never had any children. And so whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? So they thought, we got him. He can't answer this. But of course, Jesus does. In verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, 
the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, did you see what Jesus did there? Jesus tells them, verse 31, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, they don't believe in the resurrection. So Jesus says, now concerning the resurrection of the dead, how do you prove it? How do you say you have authority to teach that the resurrection is real, that it is going to happen? Notice what he does here. Verse 31, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And then he's going to quote from Exodus chapter 3. So he says what was written in Exodus chapter 3, a a statement that is found there, and then a necessary inference that is in that statement. There is a necessary implication in there. So he says, again, verse 31, Matthew 22, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and a God of Jacob. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not I was. So you see what Jesus is saying there? It's a beautiful account where Jesus goes back and he quotes from Exodus chapter 3. Moses is there standing at the burning bush, and God is speaking to him. And Moses has asked God, who do I say to Israel has sent me? He says, I am has sent you. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I am, not I was. Do you see that? When God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus points out in Matthew twenty-two thirty-two 32, that they were alive because God is not a God of the dead. He did not say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. Those men are dead. They're gone. They don't exist anymore. He's saying that they survived the grave. They were not alive on earth, but they did live. They were alive in the Hadean world. I am. I'm still their God. So Jesus uses a statement from the Old Testament and says, here's a necessary conclusion that you have to draw from what's said there. When God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the necessary conclusion is they were still living because he's not the God of the dead. And that's how Jesus said we have authority to teach on the resurrection. The Sadducees were wrong to deny it. They had no authority to deny the resurrection. And Jesus says, here's how you know. Here's what you should have understood. You should have necessarily inferred from that statement that there is life beyond the grave, which the Pharisees, or rather the Sadducees, did not believe in. So there is Jesus using necessary inference to establish authority. But we want to understand it's not any inference that we draw from the Word of God, but only a necessary inference. Inference. So we go back to Matthew chapter 3 to illustrate this. In Matthew chapter 3, we read about Jesus being baptized by John, his cousin. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So there is authority, let's understand to teach that Jesus went down into the water. The text does not state Jesus went into the water, but what does it state? It says Jesus came up immediately from the water. Well, if he came up from the water, then we necessarily infer at some point he went down into the water. So we can teach with Bible authority, Jesus went down into the water. Now, what we cannot teach, the conclusion that we cannot draw and say this is authoritative, this is something we can bind on people, is Jesus went down into the water without any sandals, or he went down into the water with sandals. 
We can't tell people these are the kinds of sandals that Jesus was wearing on that particular occasion. We can't speculate on those things because there's nothing in here. Now, could somebody draw a conclusion? Well, they usually took their sandals off when they went down into the water. Okay, maybe we would say he might have done that, but we can't say authoritatively that he did that or authoritatively that he kept his sandals on. We can't do anything like that. But we can say with authority that he went down into the water because that's a necessary conclusion. So it's not any conclusion that we may draw or any inference we may see there, but only the necessary things that would be suitable to establish authority. Now, something we want to understand on this necessary inference, because people have a real challenge with this one. They're like, "Mm, I'm not so sure about establishing authority through necessary inference, even though we've already seen Jesus do that. Well, you know, the very first way to establish the authority of the Bible in your life is by necessary inference, because there is no passage in the Word of God that specifically names you or specifically names me. It doesn't say, Stephen, do this. Stephen, do that. Stephen Deaton, you need to uh, believe in Jesus. Stephen Deaton, you need to go to church. You need to worship God. It doesn't say that, right? So there is a necessary inference that is drawn from a passage like Mark 16, verse 15, where Jesus tells his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, See, I fall under that every creature, so I necessarily infer, well, the Bible applies to me. The gospel applies to me because of that necessary inference. And therefore, that's why we say, well, this is the very first way of establishing authority to understand, well, the word of God is something that I need to listen to, something that I need to follow. So necessary inference is the first way we establish authority overall. Now, something I also want us to understand is that necessary inferences are drawn off of either direct statements or approved examples. In other words, a necessary inference isn't independent and it doesn't stand on its own, but it's very easy to see and understand and it makes sense, right? That necessary inference either comes from a direct statement in the Word of God or an approved example that we see in the Bible. So those are the three ways to establish authority, direct statement, approved example, and a necessary inference or necessary conclusion we draw off of those two. We're going to come back in a minute. We're going to see where all three of these ways are used to establish authority in a doctrinal matter that was disputed among the first century Christians. So come back in just a moment and let's study that together. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's word and discover what he desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible 
will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to that's word and sword dot com forward slash how to all right now we want to notice in the word of god how the saints of the first century including apostles inspired by god how they established authority on a doctrinal matter that was also something that promoted a practice among the first century saints, something that was disputed. Well, how do they know what's right? How do they know what's wrong? We're going to read in Acts chapter 15 exactly how the apostles and other saints settled a matter, how they established authority on an issue. And that issue was circumcision. There were certain Judaizing teachers going around saying that Gentiles must be circumcised in order to be saved. And the apostles and the other saints like James, one of the elders in the church at Jerusalem, how they say, no, that's not true. And so let's read this and see how they establish authority. First of all, we read about Peter in Acts 15, verses 6 through 11. Now, when the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved the same or in the same manner as they. So you see Peter getting up and saying, look at the example of what I did by God's direction among the Gentiles. And he's pointing back to Acts 10 when he went into the household of Cornelius, a Gentile believer in God, but not a proselyte to Judaism, how that Peter preached to Cornelius and to those who were gathered there that Jesus is the Christ and how those people at the end of Acts 10 believed and were baptized and they received the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we see in that example that God approved of the Gentiles receiving the gospel and receiving salvation through Jesus Christ without circumcision. So he gives an example and says, here's the necessary conclusion that must be drawn. And then you have Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. Now, we are not given details of what they say here, probably because Luke has just recorded all those things in Acts 13 and Acts 14. So when we get to Acts 15, Luke doesn't repeat all of that. But Notice again, they're saying, look at our example, that it's approved of God because of the miracles and wonders that we did. And you go back and read those things, and they taught people the gospel, and Gentiles were not required to be circumcised in order to receive the gospel in order to be saved. So an example, 
and a necessary conclusion. But then also you have James get up and he makes a direct statement from the Old Testament prophets. Notice Acts 15 verse 13, after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his own name or for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Now, here's the direct statement from Amos. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. So what he says here is, when we read the prophets and we see a statement from a prophet that talks about rebuilding the tabernacle of David and it being set up so that the rest of Gentile or rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, he's saying, here's a direct statement. Here's the necessary conclusion. God is going to save the Gentiles. And the necessary conclusion is outside the law of Moses without circumcision. So he's saying, we don't trouble them with those things, but we do tell them, you know, there's still a moral code to live by that is part of the gospel. It's not because it was revealed in the Old Testament, but because it's a truth now in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. You can't be involved in idolatry. You can't be involved in sexual immorality. So he says, here's a direct statement. And that's how he established authority that Gentiles can be saved without circumcision. So again, here's what we see. We see an example and a necessary conclusion. Another example with Paul and Barnabas, a necessary conclusion. A statement from the Old Testament and a necessary conclusion or a clear message that's being conveyed. And then authority was established on this truth. The way that they went through that, here is how we establish the truth of the matter and that truth then is proclaimed to the Gentiles. You keep reading down through Acts 15. You see where they wrote a letter and explained the truth on the issue of circumcision. The doctrinal issue was settled through direct statement, proved examples, and through necessary conclusions that came off of both of those things. So we see that authority being established in the New Testament was practiced by the apostles and prophets as we have laid out here. Again, direct statements, approved examples, and necessary inferences or necessary conclusions from those things. We didn't just make them up. It's not my truth versus your truth versus somebody else's truth, not my opinion, my standard versus your standard or someone else's. This is what we read how they establish truth in the New Testament. Now, we're going to come back in just a moment and apply this to a specific practice that people have differences on today. And we want to notice this and see what the Bible says about how to establish authority. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's now take the principles we have learned about how to establish authority. The three ways being a direct statement, approved examples, necessary conclusions, and apply it to the Lord's Supper 
How are we to observe the Lord's Supper? What is it we are to do to be pleasing to God? Because we see different practices in the religious world around us. Some people do it once a year only. Some do it quarterly. Some do it monthly. Some do it on special occasions, like they might do it on Easter or at a Christmas service, or they might do it for a wedding. And it could be any day of the week that that falls on. So, We see different things that are practiced by people, but let's look into the Word of God and use the principles of how to establish authority to see what we are to do, how we are to observe the Lord's Supper. So first of all, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And we read here direct statements from the Lord about what we are to do. That is, what's involved, what elements are there, and uh, what we are to do, what it's all about. So Matthew 26, let's notice verses 26 to 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took, then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So, when you read here, Jesus, by the way, in Matthew 26, 17, is observing the Passover with his disciples, and that means the bread they had was unleavened bread at the table. So, we read a direct statement. He says, take this bread and eat it. Take this cup and drink it. And you do this in remembrance of me. You you remember my body that was given for you. You remember my blood that was shed for you. This is shortly before he goes to the cross, but he's establishing this and saying, this is how you're going to remember what's about to unfold. This is how you're going to remember the sacrifice that I gave for you. So you have the what, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine for a memorial for the sacrifice of Christ established by direct statement. Now, We have an example of when to partake of it in Acts chapter 20. When are we supposed to do this? When did the disciples, including the apostles, do it? Well, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continues his message until midnight. Now, that breaking of bread there is a way that the disciples came to describe the Lord's Supper. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, if you just want to reference this, it says there in Acts 2, 42, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. So by the time Luke wrote this, it had become known as the breaking of bread that is the communion or the Lord's Supper. Because in Acts 2.42, they have the apostles' doctrine, they have the fellowship, the giving, the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, the prayers. So it's talking about their worship activities there. So anyway, we fast forward to Acts 20, and we see the day on which they did that. It says, on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread, and Paul preached to them the apostles' doctrine, right? So they're worshiping here. So we learn when to do it by an example. Now, we learn how often to do it by a necessary conclusion. Because notice this. Now, on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. Well, how often... Does the first day of the week come? If we're to observe it on the first day of the week, how often does that first day of the week come? Well, it comes every week. So we observe it weekly. Okay, now parallel to that, go back to Exodus chapter 20. Just because sometimes people hear that. They hear, well, first day of the week, Sunday, we observe the Lord's Supper. Yes, but then we make that application well, necessarily, we have to conclude that that's weekly. And they go, well, I'm not so sure about that. But think about this. In Exodus 20, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That was a command 
to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai when God declared to them their covenant and what they were to do. And he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I ask you, when were they to remember that day? Well, it's on the seventh day, Saturday, right? The seventh day, the Sabbath day. Well, how often were they to remember that? You see, they necessarily concluded, and it's built into the statement that is made there, that remember the Sabbath day means as often as that Sabbath day comes. And how often did it come? It came every week. And so when we go to Acts chapter 20 in verse 7, we see the same principle applied. When the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread, well, they came together. We know when by an example, first day of the week. We know how often by necessary conclusion. How often does that first day come? Well, it's every week. That's why we are to observe the Lord's Supper, the communion, the breaking of bread, why we are to do that weekly, every Sunday. So that's how we establish authority in the Lord's Supper. And as we wrap this up, as we think about this, we want to remind ourselves that authority is needed. It's absolutely needed. Just like where we began this study, how the Romans needed authority to bind and discourage Paul, but they didn't have that authority. So the commander was afraid because they had already bound him. You see, authority is needed in the things that we do. That's true in society, to keep an orderly society for the officials to act. And that's true in religious matters as well, and even more important in these matters, because we're not talking about a government. We're not talking about a nation. We're talking about the kingdom of God. And with Christ as king, do we respect his authority? Do we properly establish it in our lives as people who would seek to please him, as churches that would be honorable before him and to truly praise him. We have to go to the word of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, First Peter 4, verse 11. So we need authority because without it, there's chaos, there's havoc, there's confusion, there's disorder, and we need to turn to the Word of God in order to dispel that confusion, to provide clarity so we know right from wrong, what we are to do from what we are not to do, so we can have peace of mind and an assurance that we are doing God's will in our life. So Let's be committed to properly establish authority from the word of God, that we may be in fellowship with him, that we may have the hope of everlasting life, allowing it to guide us in all things in our lives. If you have questions about this, please reach out and let us know. This TV program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. We are a group of disciples dedicated to following the New Testament alone as our rule of faith and practice. We are not a denomination, nor are we associated with any denominational body, but we are simply an independent group of Christians seeking to please God. If you live within an hour or so of Newton, North Carolina, we invite you to visit one of our services either one of our Bible class services or one of our worship services, or even better, if you would join us for both on Sunday. You will find we are different from what's typically around us in the religious world. We are relatively simple in our practices compared to others because we are only striving to follow what is written in the Word of God, not adding things to it, not trying to use um, flashy ways, if you will, to draw people in, but simply to offer what we find in the New Testament as an allurement for people to come and to worship in 
the same way as saints in the first century worship. In our Bible classes, you will find us having in-depth studies of the Word of God. These are enriching studies that help us to have a deeper understanding of what is written in the Scripture. They are challenging studies as we call on one another to live up to the standard that God has given us in His Word. In our worship services, you again will simply find us doing what saints did in the first century, a simple and a reverent worship service that is respectful of God, but is uplifting and strengthening. And at times, again, it's challenging because the Word of God is sharp like a two-edged sword. It divides even asunder the soul and the spirit. So sometimes our hearts are pricked by the Word of God, and we realize that we need to make changes in our lives. And as you gather with us, you may find yourself being pricked by the Word of God. But of course, that's good because it helps us to draw closer to God. On Sunday, you can join us either at 10 a.m. for our Bible class or at 11 a.m. for our worship service. On Wednesday, you can join us at 7 p.m. for a Bible class, and we have a short service that follows that as well. And you'll be welcome to visit with us. We would love to meet you in person, to get to know you, and for you to get to know us. But especially, we would want you to be able to draw closer to God in serving Him and honoring Him in your life. So again, please join us at our services on Sunday at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. And on Wednesday at 7 p.m., you will find us assembling at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Again, that is 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. We look forward to seeing you. We continue now in our series of studies on denominationalism, common history, practices, and doctrines. The subject we're focusing on in this study is premillennialism. And premillennialism is a doctrine that is perhaps the most widespread doctrine among denominations. And it's one that's not only popular, but it's kind of a complex doctrine and also confusing because of all the complexity that is in there and the various iterations of it, various interpretations of premillennialism. It seems there's a a little bit different take on it among the various groups that are out there. But thankfully, we have the Word of God that provides clarity, so we don't have to be swept away with the confusion that is out there, with something that is not found in the Word of God. We can adhere to God's Word. We can be rooted in God's Word, if you will. Remember, Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your Word is truth. He also said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we have the truth in God's word and that truth can free us, free us from sin, free us from error in religious doctrines and religious practices, including the doctrine of premillennialism. So let's do just a very brief review of what premillennialism is. What What's the basic tenet or the basic uh, points of premillennialism? So premillennialism essentially says that when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he intended to establish a kingdom. But because the Jews rejected him, which was a surprise to God, that Jesus ended up going to the cross and decided to establish the church. At some point in the future, 
He's going to come back and rapture the saints. And at that point, the temple is going to be built. The saints will be taken off into paradise, and there will be tribulation here on earth. At the end of that period of tribulation, Jesus is going to return again. There's going to be the battle of Armageddon, the resurrection of the tribulation saints, and the judgment of the saints. And then there will be a thousand years of peace on earth when Jesus finally is able to establish his kingdom on earth. He's going to literally sit on David's throne in Jerusalem and reign for a thousand years, and all the Jews will be converted and Satan will be bound for that thousand years. They say at the end of that thousand year reign of Jesus here on earth, that the wicked are going to be raised from the dead, that they're going to be cast off into hell, and the righteous are going to be transported into heaven. So that's kind of the overview of premillennialism. Now, what we want to do is begin to break down some of the errors in premillennialism that show that the entire doctrine is a false doctrine, but we want to look at some specific points where it contradicts the Word of God. And one of those points is that the last days are about to begin. I don't know how many times in my life, and maybe you've seen this too, <clears throat> that there are people who are constantly preaching about, oh, it's the last days, or it's the last days are about to start, or I, I think we're in the last days. Well, there doesn't need to be any guessing about it. There doesn't need to be any wondering about it, and there doesn't need to be this confusion that the last days either recently started or are about to start. Because the Word of God tells us the last days started long ago, started 2,000 years ago, as a matter of fact. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, you notice Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And verse 16, he says this, Acts 2, verse 16, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. So Peter the day of Pentecost, about 2,000 years ago from right now, says this is what Joel was talking about, the things happening on that day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles. They began to speak and to teach these people. And he says, this is what Joel was talking about. Then he quotes Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days. So Peter's saying that was the last days. That included the events there were included in the last days. But let's get more specific. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, or what we might call the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, those things have been going on for centuries now. Those things in the latter times or the last days. Notice 1 John chapter 4 as well. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is, is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, the world speaks, they speak as the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And we read all of that just to make this point. There's this common idea that in the last days, the Antichrist is going to show up. And so in my lifetime, I've heard people say, well, the Antichrist was Ronald Wilson Reagan 
because his name had six letters in each of his each of his names, right? And then I heard it's Mikhail Gorbachev because he had this funny birthmark on his head. And then it was Saddam Hussein. And so there's all these speculations about the Antichrist showing up in the last days. Well, 1 John chapter 4 tells us that the Antichrist was present in the first century and very active. So yes, the Antichrist is in the last days, but the last days have been going on for a very long time. Now, one other I want you to notice in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. See, the Lord spoke to us in the last days. So what does all of this mean? You know, premillennialism says the last days have just recently started or they're just about to start. The Bible says the last days started a long time ago. So what are the last days? Well, the last days are simply referring to the last age of the earth. When you look into the Bible, there are three ages of the earth three periods of time in the Word of God. The first period of time is from the creation with Adam and Eve until Moses, and that's called the patriarchal age. And the second age is the mosaical age from Moses down to Christ. The third age is from Christ to judgment or the end of the world. So there are three ages in the Bible three periods of time that are uh, broken out or delineated in the Word of God. And because the gospel age or the Christian age is the last one, it's called the last days. So we've been in the last days for a very, very long time. Those last days are not about to begin. And so that tells us that this doctrine of premillennialism is a perverted doctrine, is a doctrine that is not rooted in biblical teaching. And when we come back in a minute, we want to continue to explore some specific things where the doctrine of premillennialism contradicts the Word of God. And that means we need to reject premillennialism. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's now look at the doctrine of the rapture, another prominent thing that is taught in premillennialism. In fact, it's one of those things that people love to talk about. Um, it's exciting. It brings anxiety. Uh, so people talk a lot about this, but it's not something that's supported by Scripture. It's something that people have taken pieces and parts of Scripture and twisted them and turned them to fit into this theory, this false doctrine of premillennialism. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because it's often used as a text to say that there's going to be this rapture, this translation of saints, that it's going to be something that happens all of a sudden. It's going to be quiet. It's going to be unknown. There's going to be somebody there one minute and gone the next. It's um, maybe exemplified in that bumper sticker, you know, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. Like, there's somebody driving it one minute, they're not driving it the next, and I guess the car just kind of veers off the road into the woods or a field or something like that. But uh, this doctrine of rapture is very popular, but we want to notice it's not there in God's Word. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, beginning then, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, first of all, let's understand that he's talking to people here who are concerned about those who have died in Christ and wondering what's going to happen with them because they're anticipating the return of the Lord because they didn't know when it was going to be. And they're concerned what, what's going to happen with those who have already died. And Paul's writing to alleviate their concerns about that as he says, you know, those who are alive will by no means precede those who are asleep. In fact, when the Lord returns, he's going to bring those who are his. And that's just simply a reference to those who died in Christ were in the Hadean world in paradise. They're going to be brought out of paradise. They're going to be resurrected from the dead. And the living and the dead in Christ, if you will, those who've been resurrected are going to join together and be with the Lord in the air. Now, here's the thing we want to get at is this theory and idea about Christ's return being quiet and unknown. Well, here it's presented as something that's very well known. People are going to know it because there's going to be this resurrection and then the saints being caught up with the Lord in the air. It doesn't say anything about being invisible, being unknown, being something that's quiet. In fact, it talks about a shout. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Over in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says when the Lord comes back that all the material universe is going to be done away with. So everybody's going to know that, right? So it's not something quiet or unknown. And we want to notice that Christ's return is only once. Because premillennialism, if you think about it, it says that there's a second and a third return of Christ. It says that the second return of Christ is going to be when that rapture takes place and kicks off the tribulation. And the third return of Christ is going to be at the end of that tribulation period when he establishes an earthly kingdom. But in the word of God, we only see one return of Christ. He came to this earth the first time when he lived on earth and he gave himself as a sacrifice. He ascended back to heaven. And the only other thing the Bible talks about is Christ returning in judgment. And that's what we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's no return of Christ in between those things. There's no second and third return, if you will. But he's coming back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The focus is on the fact that he's coming back for the saints. And all saints will join him. Now, something else. If you go to John chapter 4, or 5 rather, John chapter 5, you understand that when Christ returns, that everybody's going to know it, and it's going to be an overwhelming event. In John chapter 5, verse 28, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Premillennialism, if you remember our chart, had the resurrection of the righteous at the beginning of Christ's reign and then, or rather, um, at the beginning of the rapture and the beginning or at the end of the reign of Christ on earth, the resurrection of the unrighteous. There's nothing like that in the word of God. It says that the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected at the same time. And it says there's an hour coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says when he returns, he's coming with a shout, which may be calling all those out of the grave, with the trumpet of God, with the voice of an archangel. It's going to be loud. It's going to be overwhelming. And people are going to know that Christ indeed has returned. And then notice also again back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that when he comes back, he's coming back to get the saints and they will be with him forever. They're not going to come back or he's not going to come back, get the saints, take them away 
for seven years, then bring them back to earth, and then take them away again at the end of a thousand-year reign. First Thessalonians 4, verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. See, when the Lord comes back and the saints are resurrected, they're going with him forever, never to return to this earth because, as we said before, this earth is not going to exist. When the Lord returns, this earth is going to be burned up. It will be nothing. So the saints will not be coming back to earth. But when the Lord returns, they'll be taken with him to be with him in heaven forever and ever. So the rapture is not supported in the word of God. We need to reject that idea, not be controlled by the fear that that doctrine instills in people, but to stand on the word of God, as Paul said here, to comfort one another with these words. The Lord returns. Those who've been faithful will be with him and dwell with him in his presence for all eternity. So in just a moment, we're going to come back and notice another particular point about the doctrine of premillennialism and how it contradicts the Word of God. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study it will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth, Chapter 3, It is Written Again, Chapter 4 includes Study Aids, Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. Another thing that we've mentioned multiple times in our study together, and that is a cause of great anxiety for people, is this idea of the tribulation, that there will be a seven-year period of tribulation where people will suffer greatly here on earth, and there will be all kinds of terrible events and plagues and different things that happen where people are given an opportunity during that time to turn to Christ, like a second chance to turn to the Lord. But we want to notice again 
that that is not in the Word of God. One of the places that people point to to try to support this idea of the tribulation is Matthew chapter 24. So let's go over to Matthew 24 and see what it is that Jesus is teaching here. And it's not this idea of some future tribulation where people all over the earth are going to suffer terribly um, and be told that they have another opportunity to come to Christ to serve him and to do his will. So Matthew chapter 24, notice verse 1 here. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. So they're in Jerusalem. The disciples are pointing Jesus to the temple and by what Jesus responds, evidently they're talking favorably about the temple and glowingly about the temple. Well, and Jesus said, verse 2 now, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat at the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then will come, the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look here, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the end of the heaven, one end of heaven to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, let's pause there for a moment. Let's notice this, that when Jesus is asked this question by the disciples, they, they've said to him, look at the temple here. He said, look, there's a time coming when not one stone will be left on another. And in the disciples' mind, they're thinking, well, that's the end of the world. And so they ask that question, or actually multiple questions, in Matthew 24, verse 3. Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So they're asking, you know, when is all this going to happen? So Jesus begins to explain these things to them, what he's referring to about the temple and not one stone being left upon another. And notice that as he goes down through this, in verse 9, he says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. He's telling the disciples this, the apostles, this is something you will experience. And the disciples did experience what Jesus is talking about here. They did have to go through this time. And so we want to understand that Jesus was talking about something that took place about 2,000 years ago, something that saints in the first century experienced. It's not something saints in the 21st century are going to experience, but he says you are going to experience this. Notice also that it was a local event in Matthew 24 and verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. You see that? Those who are in Judea. Why would he give a warning about a worldwide tribulation, a worldwide event, and then tell, well, those in Judea, you can flee to the mountains? Well, if tribulation's everywhere, what would fleeing to the mountains do for you? Nothing. So it's talking about a localized event. Okay, something that deals with the temple and the stones not being left one upon the other, something that deals with the apostles and them going through suffering for the sake of Christ, and something that deals with Judea, an event happening around Jerusalem there. Well, if you go back in history and see what actually unfolded in the first century, You understand Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. When it talks about the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel in 15, he's talking about when Luke gives this description here, he talks about the army surrounding Jerusalem. Know that you need to get out. You go back and you read in history and the Roman army came and surrounded Jerusalem. They pulled back for a bit. And Jesus is saying, when you see that Roman army coming, you need to get out. You need to leave because Something very bad is about to happen. And so he's warning the saints about this terrible event that is going to take place in their lifetime. And he says, here's what you're going to see. You're going to see all these things going on. There's going to be chaos in society. There's going to be the wars, the rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. All those things are going to be taking place to tell you, hey, this is coming. This is coming. Get ready. Be aware. You need to get out of Judea. You're going to face this terrible time, so run and get out. And he says, pray that your flight is not in the winter or on the Sabbath. You see, the reason he warns about the Sabbath is because in Jerusalem, they, of course, would shut the gates on the Sabbath. And he says, basically, if you get caught in there on the Sabbath, you're trapped. You're trapped. So pray that that doesn't happen. Pray that it doesn't happen when winter. Pray that, you know, you're not pregnant or nursing in those days, that your, your wives are not experiencing that. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing in those days. Pray that it doesn't happen in the winter or on the Sabbath. A local event in Judea that's going to happen and bring great suffering to the people. Again, Jesus is answering these questions 
you know, when one stone will not be left upon another, they ask, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? And Jesus goes on to talk about, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds and the air. We don't have time to explore it in this study, but you go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah, and you see where God came in the clouds in judgment against Egypt. It's just prophetic language saying Jesus is going to come in judgment against Jerusalem, mainly and ideally uh, what we're reading about here, or the idea is that Jesus is going to judge Jerusalem for rejecting him and putting him on the cross. But he says, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. It's just prophetic language. A lot of this is apocalyptic language with which we are not very familiar, but which they understood. Now, notice that he says, again, you get down to verse 33. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the doors. The apostles would see these things and know it's very close. So they needed to take action. Verse 34, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. That generation in the first century would see these things take place. The abomination of desolation, all the suffering Jesus has been talking about. And then in verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying, you're going to see all these signs about the temple and not one stone left upon another. But when you talk about the end of the age, when you talk about the end of the world, nobody knows when that's going to happen. There's not going to be any signs associated with that. So when we look in here and we see about the tribulation Jesus is describing, he's describing something that's in the past. He's describing something that took place in the first century. He's describing the destruction of Jerusalem and the events surrounding that. The disciples were to be on the lookout for so they could escape and get away from it. Not a worldwide event, not something where everybody on the planet would go through it, but just people in that area and how they could escape that. But then also he comes along and says, look, the end of the world, nobody knows when that's going to happen. There's not going to be any signs with that. So the doctrine of premillennialism as it espouses this idea of in the future, there's going to be these seven years of tribulation worldwide and people are going to suffer everywhere and they're going to, going to be given a second chance before the Lord comes back yet again. That's not in the word of God. It's a twisting and a perversion of the scripture. So we hope you take some measure of comfort realizing that maybe things you've heard are not true but that we can turn to the Word of God and sort these things out, clear up that confusion that is there, and have confidence in the truth. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this, they have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free 
at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to that's word and sword dot com forward slash how to thank you for watching the word and sword brought to you by the newton church of christ located in newton north carolina our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of god's word and encourage you to follow the lord in all things do you want to study more about God's Word, His saving plan for man, and the church Jesus established? Please let us know, and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail, or to be added to the church's quarterly mail-out of the bulletin, or a copy of the outlines of our lessons. Call us at 828 465 30 Again, that number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials, including past episodes of this TV program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. That's again, wordandsword.com. Visit our Facebook page, facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. Again, that's facebook.com slash wordandsword. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. Our classes are for those of all ages. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information once more. The phone, 828-465-3009. Email, contact at wordandsword.com. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash wordandsword. Our website is wordandsword.com. And our address is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Turn.